Today I'm going to talk about um, something amazing that God does <clears throat> that you can't see. Um, and it's kind of, I want to give you some illustrations. Um, there's something God does that you can't see, which he does to fix up something that has happened to us that often we can't see. Are you confused? Yeah, kind of. Okay, I'll give you a story. Um, when my mum, when I was a kid and my mum would go away, uh, she would leave my father to cook. And um, I have very strong memories of when my father used to cook because what he would do is he would put a pot of potatoes on the stove and then he would sit down and read the newspaper. And you know what would happen to the potatoes? Sorry? Yeah, it got burnt. Have you ever eaten burnt potatoes? See, even the problem is my dad would just say, it's, they're okay, it's just the ones on the bottom that are burnt. You can, you can eat them and we'd eat the ones on the top, but all the potatoes tasted burnt. And I can still remember that, that taste even to the, and the smell in the house as well. The smell of burnt potatoes, not really great. And, and as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, that's kind of what has happened to us because of what sin has done in our lives, isn't it? It's like Adam and Eve... They sinned against God. They're like the burnt potatoes on the bottom, but the smell and the flavor and, and the, even the color, because burnt potatoes have a certain color, it's gone throughout the whole of the human race. So even today, if you were to eat us, we'd taste like burnt potatoes, meaning we've got sin, all right? Okay? So we've got this sin problem. That's a big problem, all right? And, and it, you can't escape it. It's just, you just have to, well, you, what would you do? Throw the potatoes out, yeah. But... God doesn't do that with us, does he? He doesn't just throw us out. What does God do? He comes up, he come, has a plan right from the beginning. Even when that happened, he says, I'm going to redeem my people. I'm going to save them. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking, what's an illustration of how God does this? And this is the one I want to talk about today. God does this thing which we call new birth. Who here has been born? Any of you have been born? Yeah? Yeah? A couple of you? Yeah? Yeah. All, right. all of you, you've all been born, okay? I got born. I was born as well. Amazing. I was born. And, and we're, that's how human beings come to be in the world. But Jesus talks about something he calls a new birth, being born again. Have you heard about that? Anybody heard about that, being born again? Yeah, that's right. We, and he says we need to be born again. And the thing with being born again, it's kind of like something that happens within us, but we can't see. Now, for, pardon? Blind. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm going to talk about that in my sermon. I'm going to give that as an illustration. So, so, um, so forget about burnt potatoes because that's kind of that's our problem. But let's think about birthday cakes. Who likes birthday cakes? Yeah, we all like birthday cakes. I like birthday cakes. Well, most birthday cakes are. Yeah. So when you make a birthday cake, there's something you're. If you've ever seen your mum or your dad making a birthday cake. They usually put stuff in it, and they put some special stuff, and usually they get a little bottle off the shelf. Have you ever seen them? And they get this little bottle, and they put some, just maybe a teaspoon or a so, few drops of it in the birthday cake, and it's this thing called vanilla. Vanilla, you've heard of that, right? Yeah, so vanilla, when, you, when you're eating your birthday cake, you're not going, oh, I can see vanilla in my birthday cake, but can you taste it? Can you taste the vanilla? You can the answer is yes, okay? You can see it, you can taste it, that's what we put in, but you can't see it, all right? And so this, so, so burnt potatoes, we burned ourselves and, and it's yucky, but God does something new. He makes us into a beautiful birthday cake and what he does is he puts vanilla essence in, and it goes through the whole, whole of us, all right? And, and that's what the new birth is like. That's what the new birth, you can't see it, okay? You can't cut into the cake and go, oh, there's the, there it is there. But God, by his Holy Spirit, he does something inside of us. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, because Jesus said to a man called Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. And he says, it's something the Spirit of God does. He makes us alive. He opens our eyes and does all of these amazing things. So that's what we need to pray for, don't we? We need to pray that we won't be burnt potatoes, but we would be birthday cakes that have got 
the Spirit of God, vanilla essence throughout us, permeating us, giving us that beautiful God flavor. All right? That's what I want us to pray for. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you do an amazing work in us. Uh, we left to ourselves, we are sinful, but you do something by your Holy Spirit, something that you, the human eye cannot see, but you give us new birth, you regenerate us, you, you make us new in Christ Jesus by your Spirit. And we thank you for that. And we pray that you would be working that work in our hearts and in the hearts of everyone we know and love. Indeed, we pray that you would be giving new birth inside the heart of every person in New Zealand and around the whole world as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn in the scriptures to the Gospel according to John, chapter 3. And in fact, I'm going to read uh, verses 1 to 21, not 1 to 15, as, as the newsletter says. <clears throat> Gospel according to John, chapter 3. We'll start from the beginning. This is the word of God. Listen to God's word. John 3 verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may, may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out 
in God. Amen, and may God bless to us that reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that even as we read and preach your word, we're engaged in a spiritual exercise because your word itself has been inspired of the spirit. And you promise that your word will not return empty, but will accomplish the thing that you send it to do. And so we really do pray this morning, Lord God, send your spirit into our hearts. Help us to receive your word with meekness and with faith and with obedience, because we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I don't know if you're one of these people who likes watching uh, makeover shows. Typically a makeover show is somebody's got like a, I don't know, like a great grandma's rocking horse or a, 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 maybe it's a, a wheelbarrow or a push bike or something like that uh, that belonged to someone in the family and it's it's a bit tatty or it's a bit broken and they take it along to someone some expert and they get it and they pull it apart and they fix it all up and they put it back together again and it gets presented back to the person and they're quite cool to watch those things uh, the ones I've, I've found the most intriguing are when they do makeovers on people have you seen those ones people makeovers so you've got some bloke, you know, he's um, all out of shape. He's kind of got this dad bod and they they uh, get him in and they're like, okay, here's a personal trainer, here's a gym membership. And, uh, you know, a few months down the line, he's he's rocking a six pack and all in shape and that. And then he's got, he's been getting the same haircut for like, you know, ever since he was 16 years old. And they take him along to Manuel's hairdressers and, $500 later, he's got this amazing, you know, his beard's trimmed, his hair's all, it's just an incredible haircut. And uh, and then they, you know, like he's been wearing his dad's clothes or something like that. And then they take him along to some high, you know, high end, uh, high street uh, uh, sh clothing shop and spend, you know, three or $4,000 on a shirt and, and a pair of pants and shoes and things like that. And then they do the big reveal. Have you seen that? They do the big reveal. The, they get the family in, the, the wife or the girlfriend and the parents or whatever it is and the kids, and they bring them out. And everyone's like, oh, no, it's amazing. You know, and they're just like overwhelmed with the transformation that has occurred in this, in this person. And, and of course, I, you know, when, when you're watching it, you're always like, yeah, how long is this going to last? Like, he's not going to be going back to Manuel's, you know, hair salon for another, like, $500 haircut every three months, or he can't... And in fact, they're probably not even giving him those clothes that he's dressed in. They, 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 he, he's probably... He can't afford to buy or spend that much money on the clothes, and, and he can't afford his own personal trainer, and, and he's just going to end up... It's, it, it'll be, you know, it looks great. Go and get a photo now, but it's not going to last, is it? Well, we know that God is in the business of doing makeovers, except God's makeovers are permanent makeovers. And they are makeovers as we were, as I was trying to explain to the children, they are internal makeovers. They're not just about hair and clothes and, and uh, muscles and, and physique. They're about the heart, okay? They're about the inner person. And that's what this passage here is talking to us about today. We know that God is in the business of makeovers simply because when you open up your Bible, what do you see? You get to Genesis chapter 3, and if it was some of you and I writing the Bible, what would happen? Genesis chapter 3, that would be the end of it. You'd shut the book. It'd be like, okay, finish with that lot. Let's get a new lot. Let's start again. But God doesn't. Even in the Garden of Eden, even as Adam and Eve have sinned and rebelled against God, and sin has, has just caused this, this tragedy in the whole human race, what does God do? He begins the work of makeover. He begins a renovation. He begins, and he has a plan, doesn't he? He has this eternal plan to bring about the renovation or the makeover of the human race, of a people the seed of the woman as opposed to the seed of the serpent. 
And so here when we um, encounter this guy Nicodemus, Jesus uses this encounter with Nicodemus to explain to us how it is God does his makeovers, how it is that God brings about renovation and transformation in the, in the human race. So who is Nicodemus? Well, Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee. He's a respected man. He's, he would be a pillar of the community. In fact, we're told here that he is the teacher of Israel. I don't know if that is deliberate on Jesus' part, but it certainly elevates Nicodemus and in, and in, in his in our minds and and how he would have been seen by the people around him. He comes to Jesus at night time. We're not actually told why he does that, except that it's possibly well he could have been busy during the day, but it's probably because he doesn't want to be seen to be around Jesus because he is too important. He doesn't want to be seen to be fraternizing with Jesus. He comes to Jesus. He acknowledges who Jesus is. He says to him in, in verse 2, he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he confesses and acknowledges that Jesus is a powerful miracle worker, that Jesus is somehow being used by God to do something very special, very unique. And he comes and he, he, wants, he has, wants to engage with Jesus. We're not really certain what it is because Jesus, right at the start, sort of cuts in and says, hey, you've got to be born again. That's a great conversation, isn't it? It's like he comes and he's like opening sentence, Jesus says, you've got to be born again. But we see how this passage is used to teach us about what it means to be born again, to be regenerated, to be renovated from the inside, how God is doing this and, and what it looks like as, as we seek to understand it. In essence, I think what, we, what Jesus explains to Nicodemus in these verses is kind of summarized in, in the epistle of John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, which says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God has been born of God. And this is what I want us to seek to understand, to understand, but not just to simply understand. I want us to believe what is explained in these verses. And I want to do that under four headings. I want to talk about how new birth opens our spiritual eyesight. I want to talk about how new birth changes our desires. I want to talk about how new birth actually takes away the domination of sin, the power or cleanses the power of sin from our lives and how new birth even gives to us right now, if you're a Christian, has given you eternal life. So let's look at this. Let's talk firstly about how it is that the Spirit of God in applying to us what Jesus Christ has done on the cross by remaking us and regenerating us, giving us new birth, opens our spiritual eyes, eyesight, gives us spiritual eyesight, opens our spiritual eyes. You see, one of the tragedies, it's a tragic irony of the fall, is that when the serpent came to Adam and Eve in the garden, what was his promise? He said, oh, you can eat of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. And they say, no, God said we shouldn't eat of it. And he says, no, God has said you shouldn't eat of it because he knows what? That the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Remember that? And you will know the difference between good and evil. But we're told that when Adam and Eve eat, their eyes indeed were opened. And what happened? They saw that they were naked. In other words, they saw the tragedy. They saw their sin. And, and, but in so doing, in effect, they became blind. And the scriptures throughout describe the condition that we have by nature in our rebellion against God. Our condition is actually one of spiritual blindness. The, in, in chapter 12 of verse 40, um, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 40 of chapter 12, we're told that Jesus says they couldn't believe. He's talking about the Pharisees. They cannot believe because God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. And in fact, if you want to have a powerful illustration of that, in, in John chapter 9, Jesus has this encounter with a blind man. He's a man 
born blind, and Jesus heals him. And he says to him, go and show yourself to the, to the high priests and to the scribes and to the Pharisees. And Jesus goes to the, the high priest, to the, the religious leaders of the day, and they get upset and they end up condemning this man and excommunicating him from the church or from the synagogue. Why? Because they reject the one who has performed that miracle in him. They reject Jesus. And so when Jesus finally, he meets up again, he goes and finds this man and he meets him and he talks to him and he, he explains to this man what has happened. And he says, for judgment I have come into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. What is Jesus doing there? He's making a distinction, isn't he? He's saying, he has come to this man who is blind and has given him eyesight. And, and in a way, it's, it's a picture of how we are by nature. That man was born blind. We are all blind, born with spiritual blindness. But God is able to give you and I spiritual eyesight. He's able to open the eyes of our souls. But those who reject and who continue to reject God they remain blind. In fact, those who think they can see, Jesus says, they are even more blind. And so Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus, and he's, he's a ruler of the Jews. He sees Jesus as a rabbi uh, and as a miracle worker, but he cannot see Jesus as he truly is. That is why I think in verse 10, you notice Jesus says, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Nicodemus was blind. He was spiritually blind. He could see Jesus. And, and maybe, you know, you've had a conversation with someone before, or maybe you think like that today. You go, I know about this guy called Jesus. You know, he was a Jew. He lived first century. He lived in Palestine. And yeah, he died on a cross. And he did some amazing things. And he gave us some great teachings, you know, like the golden rule and stuff like that. But that's all he was. And he was just a man and he died, and it's kind of a sad story. That is a, what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. That is a form of blindness. You can't actually see the truth of who Jesus really is. And he says, so he says to Nicodemus, you, you're not seeing, you're not truly understanding. And, and what you need is you need to be born again. So he says in verse 3, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the first thing that God does for a, a person, that God does in the, in the heart of a Christian, is gives them spiritual eyesight, opens their spiritual eyes, the eyes of their souls, okay, so that they can see who Jesus really is. They can see that he is the king whom God has sent. They can see that Jesus really is on the throne of God and he really is in control of all things and that we do need to bow our knee before him. Without this, we remain blind. Um, I know none of you know this, um, but I actually I suffer from color blindness. And um, it's actually color deficiency, right? Color, uh, yeah, color deficiency, I think, is a technical term. So I don't see as much green and as much red as most people. But I was sitting with a, a, a student, an optometry student, and they were explaining all this to me once. And, um, the, and I said, so what am I missing out on? What, what is it that I can't see? And there happened to be a packet of Afghan biscuits on the table. And, and back in the day, Afghan biscuits, I don't know if you remember, they came in a plastic tray, and the plastic tray was red, okay? And so he tipped the Af Afghan biscuits out, and he said, if you look through this uh, plastic tray, this red tray, you will be able to see all the things that other people see and that you are not seeing. And so I looked through it, and it was like this amazing very red revelation to me. So, you know, those cards, for example, those cards that you get with the dots on them, and I can't see any of those numbers on those cards. But if I look through the red, I can see them. And so when we think about what happens in 
the life and in the heart of a person is the Holy Spirit comes to you and I. What does he do? He changes our eyesight. He restores spiritual eyesight. And so Jesus says to Nicodemus, you need to be born again to see who the true king is, to see the kingdom of God, to see the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what new birth is. This is what regeneration is. And this is what we need to pray for, friends. If you've got someone who you love, someone who you know, and you wish that they could become a Christian, pray that the Spirit of God would open their eyes. That's, that's the, what needs to happen, isn't it? And maybe you're here today and you're like, Jeff, I hear you saying all these words means nothing to me in, in spite of the fact of my ability to communicate and all of those kinds of things. What the Bible says means nothing to me. I just don't get it. Pray that God would give you spiritual eyesight. Pray that he would open the eyes of your soul so that you would see him as he truly is. You would see the truth of the gospel. It's, you see, it's not about studying harder, friends. That's, that's not what a Christian is, someone who studied the Bible heaps. It's not about superior intelligence. There's plenty of pretty dumb Christians. It's not none of those things, is it? It's not about learning. It's, it's not even what family you were born into or whether your parents were Christians or any of these things. But it is about spiritual eyesight. It's about a work of God in your heart. Secondly, we need to understand that God, by new birth, changes our desires, frees our desires from slavery to sin. This is highlighted actually towards the end of the passage we read, where the Lord Jesus says, this is judgment that light has come into the world, verse 19, and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. You know, our natural inclination, says the Lord Jesus, is towards darkness, or in other words, towards sin. That's our natural inclination. That's, that's our default setting, you might say. That's our factory setting. We are inclined towards sin, inclined towards, as he says here, towards darkness. We, we love wickedness. We, we hate the light. Because why? Because light shines on our sin and, and exposes our sin. And not only that, but we also hate the one who brings the light into the world. And who is the light of the world? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what do we do? We want to avoid Jesus at all costs. We want to keep him uh, at, at arm's length, so to speak, from our lives. Even if we come to church and, you know, we can be at a church on a Sunday, we want to just keep Jesus at arm's length because we don't want him to get too close to us because his light will shine into our hearts and into our lives. And we might have to change the way we live, we think. That's, that's our response, isn't it? That's a natural human response. We don't want this. And so what Jesus is reminding us of here is, is that when, when he comes, when the power of the gospel comes into our lives, when the Spirit of God begins this work of, of renovation, it transforms our desires. Okay? It transforms what we want and what we hate, what we love and what we hate, and, and what we want and what we don't want. And so Jesus, he's the light who exposes our sin and exposes our heart. And he and it transforms, changes us. Previously, a, you know, you may have been someone who was like, I'm not interested in the Bible. It's just a book of fairy tales. It doesn't interest me. Suddenly you find yourself just being just wanting to read the scriptures all the time. What has happened? Your desire has been changed. I remember talking to a man who was visiting a church I was in previously. He was there on a contract. And uh, he said to me, he said, Jeff, he said, you know, um, I haven't always been a Christian. I said, tell me your story. And he said, you know, um, I used to be an atheist. And I said, yeah. And he said, no, no, I was, I was one of those atheists. I was the guy who went out of my way to make Christians uncomfortable. 
He said, I was in a workplace. I was a supervisor. He said, if any young guys came into the workplace and I discovered that they were a Christian, he said, I just loved making their lives hell. I would just say things to embarrass them in front of other people. I would try and get them to do things that I knew they wouldn't want to do. And he said, that that was me. Until, he said, one day, my wife became ill and went to the doctors. And the doctors said, we don't really know what's wrong with you and we don't think we can do anything to help you. You're very unwell. And he said, I was terrified. I was very afraid. I didn't know what to do. I was desperate. And he said, in fact, I was so desperate that one day I found myself in a church and I prayed and I said, God, I don't believe in you, but please help me. Now, isn't that a fascinating prayer that someone could say in his mind, God, I don't believe you exist because I'm an atheist, but please help me. What has happened there? The Spirit of God is transforming his heart, isn't it? It's changing his, his desire. His, his heart desire is now towards God, whereas his mind is still at that time in rebellion against God. And this is what the Lord Jesus is talking about here, isn't he? God moves our hearts towards him. We will not come to the light because Jesus says, you know, Whatever is true comes to the light, and our own inclination is to keep away from the light. But new birth changes our hearts. Very famous Scottish um, Presbyterian minister named Thomas Chalmers. There's, I think, Port Chalmers named after him down in down near Dunedin. He talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. The expulsive power of a new affection, meaning that God comes by the new birth and changes us internally so that our affections, our desires are now towards God, whereas previously they were against God. And it moves us. It has this power. It has this effect on us such that a man who is an atheist can go into a church and pray and plead for God, to God for mercy. So the new birth it changes our desires. Thirdly, the new birth cleanses you and I from the power of sin. Jesus says again in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I think really what what the Lord Jesus has in mind there is those words that we read at the beginning of our service in Isaiah, uh, sorry, Ezekiel 36, where he says in verse 26, well, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is Ezekiel 36 from verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, cleannesses, sorry, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will pour my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my laws. The Apostle Paul talks in Titus about the washing of regeneration and renewal of the spirit of God. I think this is what the Lord Jesus is talking about here, that the Spirit, when, when we encounter the Spirit of God working in our hearts and in our lives, God cleanses us. There's a cleansing that happens. He, I know he talks about water, and, and sometimes people say this means you have to be baptized in order to be saved. I, I don't think that's what it's about. It's because this is before baptism was even instituted for the Christian church. Maybe baptism symbolizes it. We don't know. But here it's a washing and a renewing of the Spirit of God. And just as the heart says Jeremiah is desperately sick and beyond all cure, so we need the Spirit of God. That's what you and I need. And if you're a Christian today, this is what has happened for you. The, the Spirit of God has come into your heart and has, has been washing you and cleansing you. And, and, and removing the power and the dominion of sin over your life. 
and 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 your your love for these things you know um burnt potatoes i talked about burnt potatoes before it's quite a powerful image that because i i just it's it triggers something in me i'm sorry if you hate burnt potatoes but you know that when you burn potatoes that flavor goes everywhere doesn't it you can't avoid it. you really have to throw those potatoes out don't feed them to the kids Okay, I know they cost money. Don't feed them to the kids. When the Spirit of God comes into our hearts and in our lives, just as, as pervasive, just as, as thoroughgoing and, and, and all-encompassing as the power of sin is, when the Spirit of God begins to regenerate us, does a work of regeneration, so also and so pervasive is the power and the working of the Spirit of God. That work of re renovation, of changing us and, and of renewing our hearts and our minds and, and cleansing us from, from sin. New birth does this work, changes a hard heart, uh, renews a depraved mind, breaks the power and the domination of sin, dead to sin, alive to Christ Jesus. And then finally, new birth, fourthly, gives to us eternal life now. You know, this is where regeneration or the new birth takes us, I think, way beyond where we kind of ever think or imagine. You know, we tend to think of our lives very much in now terms, like today and tomorrow. And we think our lives are sort of are encompassed by birth to death and that death somehow ends our lives. That, that's very much the way we think, isn't it, as, as, as uh, mortal creatures. But what, what the Lord Jesus Christ is highlighting here in, in verses 14 and 15 is that, no, when God begins and when God comes and does a work in your heart and my heart, it's an eternal work. And it's a work that takes effect now and has fruit even now. The stirring of the Spirit, it's, it's not a temporary thing, brothers and sisters. But it's something that, that has started, something that is of an eternal value. So Jesus says here, he highlights Moses. Now, I don't know if you know this story. It's in the book of Numbers. The Israelites, again, complain. They complain against God. They complain against Moses. And so God sends snakes to bite them. That's basically the story, okay? He sends snakes to bite them, and they repent. The people say, we are sorry for our complaining, but we're dying from snake bites. And so what Moses does is he takes, it, he gets a bronze snake, snake made, and he puts it on a pole, and they take it throughout the camp of the Israelites. And we're told that everyone who looks at the bronze snake on a pole, they're healed of the snake bite. And so that is why in verse 14, we see that the Lord Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, The wages of sin is death, but what? The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in fact, if you go into 1 John, this is one I recommend you memorize, 1 John chapter 5, 13, where John there writes, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, when the Spirit of God comes into your heart and into my heart as as believers, and begins to change us from the inside out, begins to transform us, you enter into a new reality. Your reality before the Spirit of God comes into your heart is a reality of judgment and death. That's the reality you are facing. Judgment and death and eternal punishment, eternal death. We we'd read about things like the fire that is not quenched, the worm, suffering, torment, 
uh, the rich man lifting up his eyes in torment. We have all of these images of, of what eternal death means. But when you become a believer, when the Spirit of God transforms your heart, you come into a new reality. It's the exact opposite, friends. Once you were looking at eternal death, now you are looking at eternal life. In fact, you possess it now. It is a new reality for you. Everything that eternal death had to offer the Lord Jesus in the gospel brings you the exact opposite, joy and peace, eternal bliss in the presence of God, beholding the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, and he says, this is something that you have now. It's not something you're hoping for one day will happen. Sure, you're, you're going to see it in a greater rea reality. But this is something that right now is yours in Christ Jesus. You may be sitting here just as we close and thinking, well, Jeff, how do, how do I know this? Like, this sort of stuff you're talking about seems to be very, maybe a bit esoteric. It sounds a little bit like very inner. How do I measure it? Well, I think that what Jesus explains to Nicodemus, we can use these things to e even examine our own hearts, to think about things. And, and by the way, remember, no two people are going to be the same. It's going to look different in every one of us. But have your eyes been opened? Do you, do you see and understand things in the Word of God that you previously didn't see and understand? Do you, do you see the Lord Jesus in a new way that you never saw him like before? You, you just had no time for him, but now you delight in him. You, you love thinking about him. He brings great comfort to your heart. He brings peace to your soul. Is that, is that something that you, you know now? Have your desires changed that's worth asking, and it's a, I know it's a difficult question to ask because sometimes we, we, we just look and we see only the negative things, but have your desires changed? Previously, you, you had no desire for God, but now you, you want to please God. You, you desire to serve him. You want, you want to see his name exalted. You want to see other people come to know him. Previously, you lived just for sin and for what it could offer you, but now you, those things give you no pleasure anymore. Have your desires changed? Your heart, your your heart beat. Is it different from what it once was? And have you do you find yourself putting off sin and looking to Jesus by faith? Let me just close with a testimony of someone who really experienced regeneration. There's a successful, very successful businesswoman. Uh, she traded in high-end fabrics, was doing very well, very successful, lived in a major center. But she had this real inner hunger, real inner emptiness that she was seeking and she couldn't fulfill. She, she feared God, but, but all she had was the law, and, and that was just giving her bondage, making her feel depressed and down. There was no freedom in that. But she used to go to a prayer meeting, every weekend, and, and uh, one day this guy called Paul came to the prayer meeting that she was at, and he told her about Jesus. He preached the gospel. And we're told that Lydia, while she was listening to Paul preaching, while he was listening, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. You can read her testimony in Acts chapter 16. You see, like Lydia... You and I, we, we all need that to happen, don't we? Praise God that he is in the business of makeovers, all right? Not external makeovers, brothers and sisters. Go for it. Knock yourself out. But that's not the important one. That's not the one that's going to last. You and I, we need the inner one, only the one that God can provide that will last for eternity, that gives eternal life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, you are so gracious. When we were far away, you have brought us near by the cross. When we were dead, you have made us alive. When we were lost, you came and found us. And placing us upon your shoulders, you have brought us back. 
And Lord, when we were blind and our desires were far from you and we were enslaved to sin and we were looking at eternal death, you by your spirit, you've come and given us eternal life. You have come and changed our hearts. You have come and changed our desires and opened our eyes that we may see Jesus. Lord, thank you for this work of new birth. And I pray that each one of us here might experience that if there's any of us here who have not been regenerated by your spirit, Lord, would you have mercy? Would you come and bring that change into our hearts today? Lord, you can do this. We can't do it. Only you can do this. And so we pray for your help. We pray that you would transform us by the work of your spirit, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.